Good evening and welcome to the 2024 Barbara Dicker Oration. Tonight's oration will be given by Professor Ron Grunstein, AM. My name is Bronte Neeland and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor External Engagement here at Swinburne University of Technology and I'm delighted to be your MC for this important event. We begin our event by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands in which we're meeting, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge any Indigenous guests and staff who are here with us tonight. Tonight we are gathered on the land where teaching and learning has occurred for tens of thousands of years. We will no doubt have an opportunity to learn much from our esteemed guest speaker this evening. It is with pleasure that I welcome our special guests, Dr. Ian Dicker AM, Associate Professor Dr. Tony Dicker, Jennifer Dicker, Craig Dicker, members of the Dicker family, Swinburne members of the board of the Barbara Dicker Brain Sciences Foundation, members of the Swinburne University Council, and of course, all of our guests here tonight. The annual Barbara Dicker Oration is an initiative of the Barbara Dicker Brain Sciences Foundation to celebrate the extraordinary achievements of research into brain sciences and the meaningful impact on society that research brings. This research is made possible by the generous support of the Dicker family and other generous members of the Swinburne community. We are deeply grateful for their trust and ongoing commitment. One of the pillars of the foundation is study into sleep disorders. Tonight, we will hear from Professor Ron Grunstein, AM, who will present on treating sleep disorders, a pathway to brain health. Professor Grunstein is amongst many things, the head of the sleep and circadian group at the Woolcock Institute, Macquarie University, senior staff specialist, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, and professor of sleep medicine, Sydney University. He'll be presenting to us on cutting edge developments in sleep disorders research, new treatments, and how sleep is connected to brain aging. The foundation focuses in providing startup grants for early career researchers, which is rare. It's notoriously difficult to obtain funding in the early stages of research career. And as a result, many possible wonderful ideas are left to languish. The Dicker family is prepared to back ideas and provide that support that is greatly needed. The foundation has funded promising work across a diverse range of topics, as, such as treatments for anorexia, speech analysis to predict suicide risk, and vagus nerve stimulation therapy for early to mid-stage dementia. Research is central to the work we do at Swinburne, whether it be 3D printable housing solutions, innovative hearing devices, or breakthrough treatment for uncontrolled epilepsy, Swinburne has gained a reputation for world-class academic excellence. Under the leadership of Vice-Chancellor Professor Pascal Cuesta, we are committed to people and technology working together for a better world. We are ranked in the top 1% of universities globally, and we re were recently recognised as the number one university in Australia for automation and control, and 24th in the world for business administration in the Shanghai ranking, Global Ranking of Academic Subjects 2024. It is now my pleasure to introduce Vice-Chancellor Pascal Cuesta to address the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bronte. Um, I too would like to start the proceeding by acknowledging that we meet tonight on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the land on which all our three campuses here are built, here at Hawthorne, but also at uh, Croydon and Wonturna. And uh, as the very proud university to have an elevate wrap, I want to draw your attention to the fact that if you have walked across our campus tonight, you would have seen our new learning circles, which are part of our commitment to just remember that learning and teaching has occurred for thousands of years here, and that this is a mission that the university continues uh, to do. So we, we are very committed um, to bringing indigenous people to our vision of people and technology working together for a better world. And in this way, on your behalf as well as mine, I would like to really um, um, register my respect for elders past and present, and also our care for the emerging leaders that will transform indigenous futures here in Australia. A very warm welcome to everyone. And I'd like to acknowledge in particular, Dr. Ian Dicker, 
also the chair of Barbara Dicker Sciences Foundation, associate professor Dr. Tony Dicker, and many other members of the Dicker family. And it is such a lovely tradition when we celebrate the life and the legacy of, of Barbara Dicker that we have the family joining us for this important occasion. I should also pass on um, the apologies from Ted Bellio, who was coming tonight and very much looking forward to the, to the talk, uh, but had a little bit of an accident and will not be able to join us. But uh, we are recording this, and so we will be able to share the, the benefit of this presentation with many more people after tonight. And of course, a very warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Professor Ron Grunstein, AM. What he doesn't know about sleep is not worth knowing, and uh, I'm very anxious to hear uh, of all the possible damage that a lack of sleep could inflict on people because I'm the first candidate for this particular award. Uh, so very much looking forward to sort of hearing uh, what uh, what can be done to improve sleep and making sure that uh, that people who don't get enough sleep can still have good favorable health outcome. And of course, we have members of our council and members of our executive with us tonight. Every year, we welcome the opportunity to facilitate meaningful and much needed conversation about mental health and brain sciences to highlight the latest research um, advancements and discovery. This annual oration is also a memorable way to remember and honor the late Barbara Dicker and her legacy and the inspiring work that B Barbara's family um, continues to carry on through the Barbara Dicker Brain Sciences Foundation. For 13 years now, the Foundation and Swinburne has enjoyed a strong and impactful partnership. The support from the Dicker family, many of whom are here with us tonight for this evening, enables Swinburne to carry out vital research that is making a real difference to the lives of people affected by neurological and psychological disorders. At Swinburne, as Bronte pointed out, we are driven by a vision where people and te technology work together to build a better world. And we are committed to using technology to advance human health and bring about important breakthroughs to deliver more for those that need care today. We do this in large part through the partnership with the Barbara Dicker Brain Sciences Foundation. And a lot of the work that we do would not happen without the support of the foundation. It includes a very generous investment in early career researchers when it is so difficult for early researchers as they're developing a track record, they are not able to kind of get the sort of grants that they will get later once they've started to kind of achieve some results. And it's been lovely to see in the, in the area coming here all those wonderful posters and all of those ideas that young early um, career researchers are developing. That research in the area of sleep, dementia, and mental health is particularly needed. Thanks to the support, Swinburne has now a depth of talent and expertise in those very important areas. Since 2010, the foundation has awarded 112 project grants, leading to many important technology-led innovations. This year, Five new project grants were awarded to enable our researchers to explore new treatment and findings related to obsessive compulsive disorder, treatment resistant depression, concussion, and sleep apnea. One project is also looking at the use of VR in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. I am very proud of the research that we undertake here at Swinburne. Much of it has got the potential to really revolutionize how we understand and eventually um, are able to help in relation to those complex conditions. And of course, tonight, we are most fortunate to welcome Professor Ron Grunstein at AM, admittedly the top ranking sleep researcher in the world, whatever the other parent at childcare said, uh, to, de to develop the oration. Professor Grunstein is an internationally recognized physician and researcher in the area of sleep disorders like sleep apnea, insomnia, and narcolepsy, as well as sleep movement disorders. He also has a very special interest in metabolic and neurobiological effects of sleep loss. That's the bit I'm really interested in. This is not only a fascinating area of research, but a critical one too. Australian Institute of Health and Welfare Statistics show that two in three adults report at least one of those sleep problems, and almost half of adults report at least two sleep-related problems. 
We all know firsthand how important sleep is to our overall health and well-being. But more than that, sleep problems pose a significant risk factor in many other chronic health conditions. Professor Grunstein, we certainly look forward to what you will share with us tonight. But to close, I want to thank the Dicker family and our other generous supporters for making this vital research possible. And I encourage everyone here this evening to consider how you can join us in bringing people and technology together to build a better world. Thank you for coming, and I know you'll enjoy the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. It is now my pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Tony Dicker, Chair of the Barbara Dicker Brain Science Foundation. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, Bronte, and thank you, uh, Pascal, for those lovely words. Go to sleep. <laughs> Barbara Dicker's mum's immortal words to five-year-old Craig, seven-year-old Jen, and eight-year-old myself. So our mother knew, was well aware of the importance of this evening's topic. Barbara passed over 14 years ago now on the 6th of June in 2010. Her memory lives deep in our hearts, uh, but also through events uh, such as this evening and through the foundation set up in her name. We could have placed a bronze plaque uh, on a, a bench at the Botanic Gardens. We could have perched a brick uh, as part of a school building fund. But Ian suggested, no, let's do something better than that and felt a better way to remember her uh, was by supporting research and therefore providing ongoing opportunities to improve our society. Our foundation has three pillars, uh, as mentioned, depression, dementia and sleep. Uh, the aim is to support, as mentioned, the early career researchers uh, in these areas to help them get started in their research careers. The side effect, of course, being that uh, all of us benefit in the long run. We're not doing anything special. We're just providing a little bit of time and money so that others can do the special things. Um, the reward we receive, uh, they're way beyond measure. Um, to hear about this breakthrough research, um, it's just things that evolved to see the progression of these careers of people from, as mentioned, even from 13 years ago and where they are now. That is just beyond anything else to us. It really means a lot. Um, and if anyone's thinking uh, of something like this in a similar way, I can highly recommend it. And this somewhat selfish inner glow that it gives you um, in doing this sort of thing. So the family thanks you all for attending uh, and a heartfelt thanks to Swinburne, to Pascal and your team uh, for making events such as this evening possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. It is truly wonderful the, to hear about the work and the ongoing support from your foundation, so thank you. It's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ron Grunstein AM, who is our 2024 Barbara Dicker Science Foundation Orator. Okay, thank you for all the, the kind words. I don't think anyone's ever said so many nice things about me in such a short period of time, <laughs> um, especially my children. Um, <laughs> Um, I also think that it's sort of wonderful that the Dicker family support this and also all the um, young researchers because they're the, they're the future. And as I've grown older and I've become more of a mentor, I realise how important it is to get funding support for young, young researchers. So I think it's, it's wonderful. Um, I didn't realise that Ian was president of the Hawthorne um, uh, was it VFL club in those days? <laughs> um, because one of my sporting heroes is, is in 1972 was Peter Hudson and uh, the famous number of, is it exactly 150 goals or was it 152 or something like that? But it had nothing to do with sleep, so I thought I'd better drop, drop that. <laughs> um, so I'll get the first slide. Yeah. 
So um, most of my work, although I'm at three different places, most of my actual research work is done at the, uh, the Woolcock Institute. I run a clinic for people with schizophrenia and sleep problems at Prince Alfred Hospital and we still have some uh, c collaborations with the University of Sydney, so I stay there a bit. We were at part of the University of Sydney till April and we made a big move to Macquarie. Um, any of you know Sydney real estate? This is Glebe on the left side, fantastic view, beautiful location. It was far too attractive for the university not to get into the sell, sell the property. So um, we're fortunately we were headhunted by Macquarie University and I have to say that it's, um, it's uh, refreshing in a way to go to a university that maybe is not sandstone and, uh, and has some sort of interesting ideas and, and it's of the right size. I actually did work with Swinburne. I was part of the CRC for microtechnology many years ago and always impressed by, you know, the, the way I think projects went ahead and the number of people here collaborating together. So I knew we were in this half and this will be the rest of the neuroscience people there. On the ground floor is a sleep laboratory with, um, I'll describe it a bit, 11 beds and 11 clinic rooms. And then we have a sleep lab with 11 beds. And then we have um, our research offices. And then we have wet labs for cell biology and so forth. So I thought I'd start with an Australian animal. Many people probably don't know that the Last month, scientists at the Max Planck Institute in Germany worked out that um, the frill neck lizard um, is in fact uh, ex exhibits uh, REM sleep. So it actually dreams, probably dreams of insects and other things that wants to eat. I'm not sure, but it was a, it's fascinating to see the. Uh, we used to think it was only mammals that had REM sleep, but it seems to have gone on to frill neck lizards. This is a bottlenose dolphin and. I wanted to highlight, sorry, I'm going to have to turn around a bit, but this is Alan Hobson's statement, is that sleep is of the brain, by the brain and for the brain. And he's actually stolen that line from uh, Abraham Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address. But, but um, what's important is it is about the brain um, and brain and good sleep requires good brain health. The bottlenose dolphin is another interesting creature who has what's called unihemispheric sleep. So like a, a number of these cetacean uh, type animals, they can put one half of the brain to sleep and the other half can wake and that's how they survive and come up for air and do all sorts of things. This is a sleepwalker who in a way is a bit like a, a dolphin in the sense that deeper structures to do with movement and emotion are active, but the cortex, the lining of the brain is asleep. And that's the, the sort of basis of sleepwalking. And we've been quite fascinated by the um, issue of sort of how the brain works. So the brain used to be, you know, many years ago, people thought our brain was like on or off. But now we realise that the brain can have components of sleep and can, can have components of wake. And what dominates may determine whether someone's behaviourally asleep, but then they may still have parts of the brain that are awake. And this is sort of relevant in research, particularly say insomnia, where people have problems with perception and sense of quality of sleep. And what we believe is happening is that the brain is not fully asleep. There are, there are islands of wake and this is sort of what you see here on when we do what are called high density EEG, you look at 256 channels of electrical activity from the brain you can see these black dots. These are areas of the brain that are awake, but the person is behaviourally asleep and, and thinks they're asleep sort of thing. Um, and they may be easier to wake up, um, but they may perceive that they're not sleeping, but in fact they are. So I guess it answered a Pascal's question about not sleeping. Maybe you are getting more sleep than you think. Uh, it's important. Um, but for sleep apnea, for example, or, or sleepiness when you're driving, you know, the issue is that people can appear to be um, awake, but in fact, their brain is going to sleep. And that's relevant for driver fatigue, it's relevant for, for sleep apnea and performance and all those sort of things. Um, and it's relevant for neurodegeneration because there's a lot of this problem about um, instability between wake and sleep 
in the brain of people with neurodegenerative disorders. So I don't know any of the House of Cards fans here, but Frank Underwood said, I loathe the necessity of sleep. It puts even the most powerful of men on their back. And uh, the, the point I wanted to make is that, that uh, sleep is a necessity, it's a need. You know, it causes um, problems in, you know, as Pascal said, a range of areas, you know, cognitive, memory, metabolic, immune, cardiovascular, so forth. It also causes things like poor judgment, um, uh, disinhibition, impulsiveness. I was going to talk about uh, circadian and sleep influences till I saw my colleague from Monash, Shantha Rajaratnam, in the audience and he knows far more about this sort of stuff than me. I won't ask Shantha to talk about it but I, the point that I wanted to make is that sleep uh, is really governed by two processes, or at least today it is. We Maybe we'll find another process. But there's the homeostatic process or process S where as you stay awake longer you build up this pressure to sleep and the often exhibited by measuring what's called slow wave activity in the brain. In parallel with that is the circadian element. So the circadian process, process C, is an alerting signal put out by the brain. And fortunately, we're giving this talk at this time of day when, in fact, your circadian system is functioning very well. If I'd be giving this talk at 2.30 after a big lunch, we'd have different problems because there is a siesta dip in the circadian system. One of the things about getting older is that um, the, these systems weaken and so sleep does become more unstable. There's more napping during the day and more insomnia at night and that's just part of the, the process of ageing. And sometimes when you see these people as patients who are, say, 75 and they complain about their sleep, if you tell them that's, that's normal, often that's therapeutic. You know, they compensate by napping and, and they're reassured. Okay, so the basic thing is as we um, get older, um, sleep disorders become more prevalent. And so, for example, sleep apnea, uh, probably 75% of people over the age of 75 will have sleep apnea. But the point about it is not all of them have a disease. And this is, this is one of the things that <clears throat> I probably won't reiterate enough is that a lot of people make assumptions about sleep disorders but and sleep apnea is one of them where they say there's a billion people in the world with sleep apnea but there's a lot of breathing irregularity as you get older and that's a normal phenomenon as the brain brain ages. It doesn't seem to be causing much in the way of um, effects that say a younger person with very severe sleep apnea would have. Insomnia, you know, very high percentages will have um, insomnia. Um, but how much of it is a problem, how much it affects function varies a lot from person to person. The thing that we, we look for is, is what are called EEG signatures. So some of these signatures are specific sort of waves. So I mentioned slow wave before and there's actually a particular stage of sleep where slow waves predominate called slow wave sleep and that is something that reduces as we, we get older and people have speculated with a healthy ageing in fact has more slow waves and we can talk about that in a minute. Um, there's also things called sleep spindles which are uh, outputs of uh, what's called the thalamoreticular nucleus in the brain and that is important for memory consolidation. So if there's damage to the slow wave mechanisms, damage to the spindle mechanisms, your cognition is affected. So for example, schizophrenia, they have terrible spindles, dysmorphic spindles, and uh, we look at treatments to try and improve uh, the spindle appearance. I guess the bad, the bad news about dementia is that it starts, the process starts a lot before you actually get demented. And this offers an opportunity in terms of prevention, but it's, it's important when we consider sleep and the, and the brain, that there may be interventions that we can do to improve sleep and therefore uh, improve uh, brain ageing and reduce the, the prevalence of, of dementia at a fairly early age. So a lot of our focus, for example, in sleep apnea at the moment and looking at people with mild memory disturbance is how, you know, looking at how aggressive we should treat that condition and what treatments are available. So we deal with a lot of these sort of conditions. Um, we have a team that looks at dementia with Lewy body disease particularly sleep aspects and circadian aspects. 
that's a sort of uh, condition which has some similarity in pathophysiology with Parkinson's disease, but is actually one of the commoner causes of dementia. Alzheimer's, I think everyone knows about. There's you know, vascular dementia, so you know, emphasising the impr- importance of of making um, things like hypertension, diabetes, and so forth properly treated. Um, and then there are the genetic dependencies, frontotemporal and other genetic sort of dementias, which um, again we have a, a team who who look at that. So sleep disturbance is a key feature of dementia. So what, what I'm, I think, if you can picture. Um, poor sleep uh, will lead to brain accelerated brain aging, but also the other way around. That you know you, you get poor sleep as if you know, as your disease progresses. One of the the problems in sort of research for us is you know where we're looking at sleep interventions is is that up until fairly recently the main way of diagnosing people and sort of proving that they have, um, uh, you know, amyloid and tau and these sort of things has been, um, you know, use, the use of PET scans and it's not that easily available, it's very expensive. Um, fortunately, there's a revolution in this area where blood-based biomarkers are changing the game. And for us, it makes it a bit easier when we're looking at some of the interventions I'll talk about uh, to actually measure change and, and, and the, the sort of the bad, biomarkers, whether they go down and, and so forth. And some of these, you know, measure neuroinflammation, but others are more specific to certain types of dementias. And I don't want to go into it, but you, you need to know that, that that is a really developing field. And we collaborate with um, Professor Ralph Martins, who's one of the pioneers in this blood-based biomarker uh, area. Okay, so, I mean, just wanted to emphasise again this EEG signature. So we collect a lot of sleep data on people over time and we're looking at people with you know, memory disturbance or, or mild memory disturbance or what's called mild cognitive impairment, which is a sort of where, where some of those patients will develop Alzheimer's disease. And we look for these signatures that we believe are associated with accelerated brain ageing. And, and measure and measure this over time because that will give us an impetus in terms of uh, people that need to be treated and so forth. So some of these um, things are in fact things that we don't normally look at, such as these um, very sh- sort of uh, slow slow waves and spindles, as I've mentioned, but also sort of some of these waves here, which is sharp waves or ripples. A lot of that research has come from uh, colleagues who actually have taken advantage of patients who have EEG electrodes in their brain for epilepsy and have really enabled us to understand what, when we do a high density EEG, what does that actually mean and what does that represent, you know, when you actually do a deep dive into the brain. So it's a sort of exciting area. The other important thing is the glymphatic system and that's something that really has only been recognised properly in the last 10 years and it's the lymphatic system of the brain. So you know the lymphatics are, you know, most people are familiar with breast cancer and people getting lymphedema and that's because the lymph uh, clearance from the arm is, is damaged. You can also damage the clearance of toxins from the brain but, um, you know, that um, people are saying that post-traumatic um, brain injuries relate to this. But in our field, what's been shown, firstly in animals and then in humans, is that sleep is critical to a normal glymphatic function. So that you can, if your glymphatic system is working properly, you should be able to clear these toxins. And slow wave sleep is integral to the clearance of toxins. So people with uh, lack of proper slow wave sleep you know, are believed to be more at risk of developing dementia because of the build-up of toxins. It's very early days yet, and one of, again, the problems in this area is measurement. You need to do fairly complex MRI scanners to get some idea of the glymphatic system, but people are working on simpler ways uh, to make measurements, including some of our researchers who are looking at, at uh, a technique um, called near-infrared spectroscopy of the brain to see if that will help us work out the glymphatic system. So our group has a number of um, teams. Um, 
the main area of these four and we have a, what's called a synergy grant um, which is an HMRC that funds 10 investigators of which five of which are now based at Macquarie and we do look at cohort studies, we look at these brain-based biomarkers, we look at digital health initiatives. Um, the Centre for Chronic Diseases of Ageing is some, it's a charitable donation uh, from the Heiner Foundation and that's focused on breathing problems and sleep problems and how they interact. So we're, we're looking at actually chronic lung disease because many people with chronic lung disease do develop accelerated brain ageing. Our sleep clinical trials group is really involved in all our intervention work, uh, be it pharma pharmacological or device based. And we have a very you know, big team of people now. Um, and in the sleep clinic, as I said, we've got um, a lot of beds uh, where we can do research. Um, we have various specialty clinics and we have even now a brain health and sleep clinic to look at people with sleep problems and you know, memory disturbance. All of this is what I think is key to research a lot in clinical medicine is interdisciplinary. So we bring together neurologists, sleep physicians, neuropsychologists, um, even dentists who make devices for sleep apnea. We put them all together and we try and come up with solutions to problems. I'm just going to talk about a couple of disorders um, that are relevant to my point about um, uh, interventions and, and, and how that uh, can change brain health. I want to talk about narcolepsy and particularly about narcolepsy type 1. Um, it's not a very common condition, 0.03% of the population. Uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, which is uh, another brain sleepiness disorder, um, is much more common. But narcolepsy type 1 has a fairly unique uh, pathology. And what narcolepsy type 1 quickly is, it's a disabling sleep disorder. People have profound excessive daytime sleepiness uh, with fragmented sleep at night. You know, they, they say they got insomnia at night. But the hallmark is abnormal REM sleep phenomenon. They go into components of REM sleep without sometimes going to sleep. So cataplexy, which I'll show you, is a condition where under strong emotion, uh, laughter, anger, exhilaration, um, you know, watching Peter Hudson score his 150th goal, whatever, but um, that causes people to lose muscle tone as one does when they go into REM sleep and then may even fall to the ground or their face sags or so forth. Sleep paralysis is another phenomenon where you, as you're going off to sleep, the paralysis of REM sleep comes in and uh, you're awake, so it's a bit scary. And hypnagogic hallucinations are dreaming while you're actually awake, so you're seeing things it's a dream, but you actually can, can see. There's a particular tissue type which is common amongst almost all people with narcolepsy type 1. So entering REM sleep, as I show you here, just from the, the top down, um, you can see brain waves become more wake-like. There are the arrows there showing the rapid eye movements. Um, the muscle tone in the chin, the electromyogram falls out off and it goes, you know, relatively atonic and sometimes airflow becomes irregular. So I want to show you this patient of mine. Okay, so this is a, a dog, as you can work out, L lives in Goulburn. Um, I didn't charge him, that's all right. um, but um, <laughs> anyway, they give him chicken, they're trying to get, he's trying to eat it, but he keeps, he's excited and he loses muscle tone. And then it falls to you know the ground. Finally, gets hold of the chicken, but then can't eat it because he goes completely atonic and then completely asleep. Um, and I think we go close up to him, and you should be able to see him twitching, which is a sign of, of uh, particularly sign of REM sleep in, in particularly in dogs. So this is not cataplexy, but dogaplexy. Um, <laughs> Um, so, so the difference really between, I mean, in dogs, it's a problem with the signaling process of a chemical called the rec, brain chemical called the rexin, but in humans, it's absence of a rexin. So the rexin neurons are, are missing. Uh, and that's patient with narcolepsy on the left and uh, on the right is, um, you know, normal amounts of a rexin. 
and this is only something that was discovered really in the, the late 90s. I remember going to the first conference where they presented this and it was, it was amazing. But um, the, um, there's a sort of very low levels of orexin, and these are post-mortem samples, but you can measure the cerebrospinal fluid and the orexin is absent in narcolepsy type 1. So basically what orexin does is it keeps sleep stable. So stable sort of sleep when you're you know, asleep, stable wake when you're awake. Basically, this, this diagram shows that there's a balance between neurons that want to put you to sleep and those that keep you awake. And orexin is the sort of, you know, master manipulator there that keeps you in one state or other in a stable fashion. Without orexin, um, you get uh, unstable sleep. So the, the problem there is that, as in narcolepsy, they get irresistible sleepiness during the day, but wake up, sleep, wake up, and at night, the same sort of problem. Their sleep is disrupted and they become quite severe insomnia. The point about orexin is that it decreases with age and therefore um, may be partly responsible for the higher prevalences of sleep disturbance, uh, you know, as sleep becomes more unstable as you age. What I wanted to show you was that it took a long time to develop um, something orexin that could replace what's missing um, and eventually uh, the f sort of pharmaceutical industry uh, with a lot of basic researchers managed to develop what are called orexin uh, receptor agonists and also receptor, orexin receptor antagonists. So the agonists would keep you awake, the, the antagonists would help you sleep. Um, and this is again a fairly recent from a fairly new, new drugs. We've just been involved in uh, study looking at orexin agonists, so to keep people with narcolepsy and other disorders like um, idiopathic hypersomnia awake. And basically the, the test that we use to see whether people are, how awake people are is what's called the maintenance of wakefulness test. So imagine being put into a dark room, um, sitting in a very comfortable reclining chair, uh, EEG attached to your head, and you're not, no, there's no stimulation. And so we measure how long it takes someone to fall asleep. And people with narcolepsy basically will fall asleep within a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. Um, whereas most people can, as I'll show you, get out to 30 minutes. So if you look here, there's a dotted line up the top and that is what's considered normal wakefulness with repeated testing on this maintenance of wakefulness test. And these pe people will have five tests across the day and, and, for, and they're kept in this comfortable chair for 40 minutes um, and we, we measure how quickly they, they fall asleep. The point I'm making is if you look at the, um, the two bars to the left, that's say narcolepsy type one, they're severely affected. They go to sleep really quickly. You give them an orexin agonist and this is uh, one developed by an American company called Alchemist, uh, you actually get remarkable levels of alertness, a uh, bit dose dependent, the higher dose, but you know, you're pushing people well into near normal or normal range. And this is revolutionary because up until now, narcolepsy drugs have been, you know, stimulants, which actually don't do the job very well. And people generally are disabled, unable to hold jobs and so forth. So this is just what's called a phase 1B, a very early study, but it's, it's a sign and there's already phase two and phase three studies being proposed. The point I wanted to make also about brain health is that orexin is something that is now being considered targeting Parkinson's disease because animal models of Parkinson's disease show that orexin can do things like increasing dopamine in the brain, which is the defects, um, and all sorts of things that are listed on this slide, improving mood. You know, I mean, it's still in rodents, but it needs to be translated into to human research and, and will. Um, but the principle has been based on understanding the alerting effects of this drug and, that, and has other, other effects that help with cognition. You know, this may well be revolutionary of the field. I mentioned orexin antagonists. So there are three uh, currently commercially available, two in Australia, 
And again, they actually normalise sleep without causing too much in the way of grogginess and drowsiness in the morning and they normalise. They don't affect sleep stages like the old benzodiazepines and, and, and uh, previous sort of drugs. So they have significant advantages. Where they're relevant in dementia is the early rodent studies showed that giving this, uh, these drugs to, to rats with, it, with um, amyloid accumulation, their amyloid started getting chewed up and, and reducing. So that became an interest and now uh, there are lots of studies going on in older people with mild cognitive impairment and even Alzheimer's to look at improvements in sleep and improvements in, in symptomatology of their, of their dementia. But again, it's, it's research that originally shown from studying uh, insomnia. Finally, I just want to talk about new approaches to treating sleep apnea. Um, I was very fortunate to be involved in the early development of a continuous positive airway pressure CPAP therapy for sleep apnea. My job was very glamorous. I'd make a fiber, uh, mold of a patient's nose and uh, make a fiberglass mask, which then we attached to their nose with glue and delivered the positive airway pressure. Um, so it's come a long way since the early 80s, and that's the old blower motor on the right there. But um, CPAP is now, you know, Resmed's a $40 billion company, as many other providers. It's a huge industry, um, but there's a challenge. The challenge is coming from uh, what are called incretins or incretin memetics. Most of you know about Azempic, and Azempic is, is, is one of them. Um, but we studied a, a drug called tazepatide, which is Zempix made by Nova, Nova Nordisk, uh, tazepatide's made by Eli Lilly. So tazepatide is both a GLP-1 and a GIP agonist. And these incretins are things that happen to all of us when we eat. Um, what stops us eating is that you get a sense of fullness. Messages go to the brain saying, stop eating. And um, that may be a bit simplistic, but that's the way it is. And as you know, these drugs um, have been shown to be remarkably effective in terms of, of weight loss. And there are now probably 50 different types of incretins under development. Some, each one probably better than the other, more effective uh, and so forth. I'm happy to answer any questions about what, what to take, but no, no so, <laughs> sorry. The um, Samount OSA was the study that we did and it was a global study where we, it was four of us on the steering committee which, and it was a major uh, study funded by Lilly. And there were two groups of patients, <clears throat> one who people who had refused to use CPAP therapy and others who used CPAP therapy but stopped their therapy for seven days before they, they had their follow-up sort of sleep studies. Um, and that's important because we wanted to know what the underlying disease, how, how it was going. Um, so this is the weight loss and my eyesight's pretty bad. I can't, it was about sort of um, um, 18%, something like that. Um, and in longer studies, they've gone to 72 weeks, you get about 22% weight loss. So I want to stress these were people with severe obesity, their body mass index was on average 39. And, um, you know, that's severe. A lot of those patients would normally get bariatric surgery. And um, similarly, their sleep apnea was also very severe. So they had 50 events per hour of sleep on average. And these events had to have falls in oxygen level of 4% at least. So these are the severe patients. Um, and Basically what you saw was a 60% reduction in the severity of sleep apnea. And you may say, well, CPAP therapy gets rid of sleep apnea, but the problem is that most, probably a majority of people either don't want to use it or, don't, or use it very sparingly. So it's an it's a efficacious therapy, but not always effective. Um, so there's a lot of limitations with CPAP, but one of the other things about CPAP is it doesn't do anything so far that we found to glucose regulation or diabetes. There's no evidence of prevention of cardiac events with CPAP, except maybe in the most compliant of patients. Whereas these incretin drugs, um, although it's a weekly injection, they do lead to marked weight loss and less diabetes as I'll show and less cardiac events. 
So this just came out last month and this is a three-year study of tazepatide um, in compared to placebo and probably the thing to concentrate on is the bottom uh, graph which is basically the tazepatide patients. There was hardly any new cases of, of diabetes. Um, these are people with pre-diabetes and obesity and you know, at risk of diabetes. Virtually no one got diabetes whereas the, the quarter of the patients that were on placebo, you can see there the rising incidence of new cases of diabetes. So this is, a, you know, we still don't understand from a sleep apnea point of view what the impact will be. Everyone talks about cost and so forth, but there's so much competition that's going to happen in this field that costs must come down. The other thing that I wanted to say is that G GLP-1 drugs uh, and incretins should be, some people say they should be in the water supply because they do all these sort of wonderful things, fix up bad kidneys and all this sort of stuff. But one thing they do, at least in animal models, is fix the brain. So we know that diabetes, for example, is a big risk factor for, for Alzheimer's and, and vascular dementia. But uh, the drugs themselves have specific effects that reduce bad things that go on in the brain. And again, this is something that um, uh, takes a while to show, obviously, in, in, in research. Um, so, for example, in Parkinson's disease, there are studies going back nearly 10 years where looking and showing benefit, but they were using very ancient type of uh, incretin drugs, drugs that were like exanatide, which was interestingly isolated from a, a lizard, Gila monster in America, and it's a very, um, no one uses it anymore. Um, so a lot of trials need to be done now using these new drugs to see if they can influence the symptomatology and also the progression. Finally, I just want to end up by saying, you know, one of sleep and other sleep disorder that gives us an insight into Parkinson's disease is REM sleep behaviour disorder. And you remember with, with narcolepsy, they lose muscle tone. But what happens if your muscle tone doesn't go away when you, when you enter a dreaming sleep, REM sleep? Well, these guys act out their dreams, mainly majority of men. Um, and what's important about it is that greater than 90% of people with REM behaviour disorder will develop Parkinson's disease or a similar Lewy body disease or, or, or similar conditions that involve um, the, um, what they call synucleopathies. What I'm trying to say is that this, this guy, um, why I wanted to show it is that he, he starts punching, throwing his pillow as if someone's, you know, he's dreaming, someone's attacking him. So he's acting out his, his dreams. I've got another one of him uh, singing the French national anthem and marching. He was obviously a, a soldier. So, but the point I wanted to make was that this is a sleep disorder that gives us a window into early prevention of these diseases. And again, that's, I guess, the message where this is important for sleep disorders are important, you know, in the pathway of solving brain health problems. So I just wanted to end by thanking um, really people on the left are um, our postdoc team and they do all the work. I just do the paperwork these days. Um, the NHMRC, which has funded our research for a long time, MRFF, um, the Heine Foundation and Babak Moeni is a philanthropist in Sydney. We, we do these trials and yes, they are, uh, we do make a profit, but we churn everything back into research after we've paid people. We don't have any complaints, but um, the, um, you know, uh, a lot of the doctors work for, for nothing really to help us uh, with this and it's great. And that is one of our ways we also fund our younger researchers. But thanks for this honour. It's much appreciated. Sorry if I've gone on too long, but I'm a bit distracted today. But um, um, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, my name is Gavin Lambert. I'm the director of the Office and Health Innovation Research Institute here. And my role tonight is I'm the question monitor, I believe. Uh, so if anybody's got questions, then please put your hand up and wait. We've got some roving uh, microphones for you. Uh, I'll kick things off though, Ron. Your, your work with the Azambic, the Incretans, etc. The individuals, they lose you know, probably 20, 25 kilograms of loss. 
but they're still obese. Is the effect that you see, is it weight loss or is it a central effect of the drugs? Uh, I think there's reasonable correlation with the weight loss. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, 20, we've done studies before with other drugs where we've had patients who achieve 15% weight loss and a lot of their sleep apnea goes away. I just wanted to stress these guys are severe, you know, and they sometimes they might need both CPAP and the, and the weight loss drug, but in sort of a patient who's overweight, um, obese, whatever, but with relatively milder sleep apnea, I mean, I think it cures the condition. I mean, we had... I uh, don't think I'm breaching confidentiality. We had about uh, ended up with eight or nine people on active drug, and six of those stopped their CPAP therapy. So you know, it, it, even even though they had severe disease, uh, you, you touched on in your talk. You mentioned about digital health. Where do you see technology and technology developments in terms of uh, monitoring, diagnosing, and managing people with sleep disorders? Yep. I mean, I think. In a population sense, it's quite important in terms of diagnostic to reduce the the burden on the community and so forth of costs and so forth. But I think there's still a lot of value, particularly when we're looking at some of these biomarkers from from sleep studies and, and actually measuring sleep directly. The other areas, of course, all these gadgets and and uh, wonderful sort of technology and some of these companies have come and, and they've, they've gone. But the bottom line is that um, I think there's a use, but there's also this problem, and, and you may have heard of the term orthosomnia, where people get obsessed by their sleep. And, you know, and often the people who don't need to wear these watches are the ones who wear them, you know, because, and, and uh, I think this is one message that may be, I'm not saying this to reassure Pascal, but, um, you know, we worry, people worry a lot about sleep. Um, and there's a few of our colleagues who I won't mention their names internationally who kind of doom and, you know, Dr. Doom, you know, they, they're sort of, and I, and I think that's a disservice because for most people, firstly, sleep problems can be fixed, but also a lot of people don't really have a severe problem, even though they maybe think about it. So people who say, if, you, if you've got bad sleep, you're, you're definitely going to get dementia. That's just not, not the case. Jason. Yeah, I think yeah. at the start of the talk you mentioned mm -hmm. slow wave sleep and how perhaps sometimes it's active when people are awake. And I know there's some drugs that can actually enhance slow wave sleep while people are awake. What does that mean in terms of our knowledge of sleep? So, sorry, the drugs that... that so can enhance slow wave sleep yep. when people are awake. Yep. Um, so what does that mean for our knowledge of sleep? How do we know when someone... So can you give me an example of a drug that you mean? Yeah, so... Uh, I'm trying to think of it. It's... Um, that's all right, I just... Tigerbeam. Um, Tigerbeam, okay. So, so that, that was tried in insomnia, as, as you know, and, and um, it had caused some sort of side effect profile that meant that the drug was sort of never, never pursued. But there are those um, certain drugs, um, gam, you know, gamma hydroxybutyrate can increase slow wave sleep, but, you know, um, it's available... But, but it's uh, highly restricted. It, it's the date rape drug at uh, GHB. So, um, so those things, but we're looking at how to enhance slow wave by you know, things like direct current stimulation of the brain, um, I guess reducing sleep apnea, which <laughs> Im impairs slow wave sleep. Um, but I think as we're understanding more of the mechanisms, there'll be more of these medications probably that, that, in, that, that will lead to improved slow wave sleep just in general, yeah. yeah. Actually, we just talked about that with the Fitbit and Aura ring, but I think you kind of touched on it, saying that we can... Um, so I think you kind of touched on it, but um, whether or not you think that the... Um, when you look at your Fitbit, they tell you what the the norm is, do you think that those are informative for us, like where, where they get that data from? The, you know, I'm always measuring yeah. the rest of the population, my age group and gender. Yeah, I mean, there's huge you know, data base of normative data, but you don't often know a lot about those those patients. Uh, well, not patients, but they're sort of the, in the community. I'm not trying to dispel the concept that these are valuable, but I'm... I'm concerned that a lot of them will give people the wrong message um, and that, you know, 
rather than looking at this, the, you know, doing more exercise, doing, you know, healthier lifestyle, that sort of thing. I sound like RFK Jr. But, um, <laughs> so, um, um, but, but um, yeah. Sure yeah. <laughs> I don't, did anyone read that he, he, he now admitted that he dropped a, put a dead bear in Central Park and because he wanted to demonstrate how dangerous cycling was in Central Park? And this, anyway, yeah. don't get me on the subject. In the background. Yeah, hi. I had a question about the Orexin agonists and antagonists. Yep. How far away from the Orexin agonists are they? So Orexin antagonists are available at your friendly pharmacist but at a cost because the government doesn't subsidise it. I don't know, um, but Lembarexan is probably, um, the, and there's Suvarexan. That, so Lembarexan's called Davigo and I don't know where they get these names from, but Bill, and Suvarexan's Belsomra. And, um, you know, like I take it when I fly, right? I mean, I don't wanna, I'm not trying to sell the drugs, but, I mean, there's certain situations where you kind of, it's an advantage, but you don't don't wake up as groggy, and and you um, and that's shown by studies of driving behaviour in the morning and waking people up at night and getting them to do all sorts of bizarre things and you know cognitive tasks. So, Erex and Agonis, um, I think those will be. I mean, if if the trials are successful, probably uh, three to four years, um, realistically. And one final question. I'm just sure a final question. Uh, with the ageing population, I mean, your studies seem to stop at 60. Um, many people are living to their 90s. Uh, is, there, uh, is, there, is there research going on for people later in life to find out how... You know, we do research, like, we, we have... You know, people who go to memory clinics and... and uh, we do research in, you know, people with mild cognitive impairment. Don't do a lot of research with sleep studies in people with established Alzheimer's because it's it's often quite difficult and disturbing for them to do that. But mild cognitive impairment. My colleague Angela De Rosario, she um, she studies a lot of of mild cognitive impairment patients and looks at the signature, and particularly following them up to see who actually develops more severe uh, symptomatology and, and Alzheimer's or, you know, dementia. And, um, yeah, that's what, you know, so I don't want you to think that we stop at 60. I'm just saying that, you know, maybe we should be looking at people age 50 and 60 to prevent them getting dementia when they're 80. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 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 Sorry. Uh, two more. Before the drugs, uh, what about uh, interventions as far as physical exercise and uh, modifying, oh, you talked about modifying diet and so forth, that's obviously extremely important. Yeah. Is there an emphasis on physical exercise? Yeah, I mean, I think if you look at the sort of tables that people produce, all these big um, dementia sort of working parties, I mean, healthy lifestyle factors are all, all you know, not, not just exercise but what you eat you know, and, and how you live and all that sort of stuff. I mean, you know, um, maybe people, you know, in the 60s and 70s who use too much cannabis often yeah. kind of end up in... <laughs> You're going back to probably Kennedy now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your response and for your time. Now I'll pass on to Professor Ogloff, who's going to close the evening. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for, for the talk. Uh, just wanted to say a few remarks. Uh, first of all, I think we had a really good um, opportunity now to hear your experience, your expertise, delivered in a really erudite and engaging manner. So we really appreciated the humor, making what could otherwise be a dry topic really uh, engaging. Uh, I think for me, I got increasingly anxious as the talk went on. Uh, I did have questions such as, define aging. <laughs> and when the obesity came up, I thought, I've lost it. So, uh, so I really uh, personally b gained a lot. I wrote down a number of uh, interventions that you identified, uh, and I'll be uh, calling you very soon. Uh, so, uh, but you did, on a serious note, you highlighted the critical connection, which is very important to us, between sleep and overall health. 
particularly for people as we age. And uh, you've inspired us, I think, to reflect on the importance of sleep in our own lives. And your discussion, I think, and some of the answers were really reassuring to, to us. Uh, I think more importantly for this oration, the presentation aligns perfectly with the commitment of the Barbara Dicker Brain Sciences Foundation into advancing research that improves quality of life. We're really d very grateful not only to your talk tonight, but for your dedication to this vital field and for sharing your knowledge with us, with us this evening. We'd like to thank you again for your time, for your commitment, and for your expertise. And please accept the small gift and recognition of delivering the oration. Thank you very much. OK, this concludes the oration. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending this evening. And please allow the front rows to exit first before you run out of the room. So thank you very much, and good evening. <laughs>